Good afternoon. My name is Edmund Shaw. I'm really sorry that I'm not able to join you in person as I'm away on medical leave. As I also have limited mobile data, I don't think I'm able to zoom in and hence this pre-recorded video lecture. But I'll try to call in after my presentation to see if I can have a more interactive Q&A. So let's begin. My doctoral research examined the representations of Afghan identities through theatre practices inside and outside Afghanistan. Now, my PhD journey started in 2011 and ended in 2016. And during those five years, I had been to Afghanistan twice, once in 2011, to see the feasibility of doing research there. And then in 2012, when I took a gap year to join a local non-government organization, an NGO, to manage a radio project. I am an applied theatre practitioner. My original intention was to develop a theatre intervention program for children in a refugee camp. But because there were too many unknowns, you know, I have never worked in a refugee camp, have never been to Afghanistan, have never done any humanitarian work. My supervisor, Professor James Thompson from the University of Manchester, told me to shift my focus. I kept Afghanistan as my area of study, uh, but changed my topic to doing an ethnography and identifying what kind of uh, cultural practices existed in Afghanistan, if there were theatre groups at all, since it was presumed that the Taliban had banned them. And if they survived, what kind of stories and performances did they produce? I acknowledge my positionality as a cultural outsider, especially governed by the principle of non-maleficence or do no harm to research participants. Now, now coming from a university setting in preparation for the IRB approval, I had to ensure that I adhere to the usual principles such as respect for persons, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. This means that in my documentation, I needed to prove that informed consent has already been made with participating organizations, that the scope of the study would also protect the rights and dignity of those involved, um, maximizing in benefits, minimizing harm, and avoiding potential conflicts of interest. Here you can see that I had to prove that I was a PhD student from the University of Manchester and that I had letters of consent by Kabul University, British Council, as well as the Afghan Embassy, as well as very detailed documents on my research before I could proceed. And as I was going into a conflict zone, ethical considerations also meant safety not just for participants, but also for the researcher. Hence, I needed to describe the car routes that I will be taking, which should be different every day, as a security measure to prevent myself from being a target of terrorist attacks. As you can see, this is quite paradoxical. You know, I had to enter Afghanistan first and be relatively familiar with ground realities and potentially put myself at risk, even before I could submit my forms for ethics clearance. Eventually, the university did not approve my going to Afghanistan, as I could not guarantee them my safety. Now, here was my first dilemma. Do I continue my research in Afghanistan, or do I research on Afghanistan? You know, if I were to write about Afghanistan's cultural practices, Without having been there, I would feel like I am an armchair critic whose voice has no weight. One year into my PhD, I was approached by an Afghan NGO to work for them. I immediately jumped at this opportunity, took a gap year, and immersed myself in the culture while managing a 37-episode radio drama, which coincidentally felt like a nice fit because I get to meet actors producers and people in the theatre 
as well as in the entertainment scene. But you see, when people mention do no harm, that axiom does not provide real-world guidance. Because when I was there, one representative working for one of the UN agencies came to me excitedly. Oh, I hear you do theatre. We've been trying to uh, empower girls. What say you if we go into a village, play a loud gong, and have the girls gather outside and then tell them about women's rights and children's rights? Theatre will be a good way to engage. What do you think? I immediately said no. How can we be so irresponsible to educate them, show them the light, and then let them go home like that? I mean, what will happen if these children demand for their rights? And what happens if their fathers are old-fashioned and conservative and become abusive towards them? What are the implications of our social justice agenda? Now, here's another anecdote. A Caucasian man, whom I was told would be my colleague at the NGO, arrives at a guest house, puts his luggage down, and excitedly leaves with a camera in his hand. Where are you going? You just arrived, I said. Oh, just walking around. I want you to understand the terrain, he said. But we can't just walk around on our own just like that, I interjected. It's okay. I'm a journalist. I'll be fine. Hours later, he comes back safely and starts talking about the children he met, the photos he took, and how friendly the Afghans were. I could not respond because I know he meant no harm. But did he do any harm with his camera? I don't know. But I remember Susan Sontag once said that just as a camera is a sublimation of the gun, to photograph someone is a subliminal murder, a soft murder, appropriate to a sad, frightened time. Here's another anecdote. We had just moved into another guest house. Our house was like a two-story bungalow with a large open roof. You know, people usually use the space to hang the laundry. And as our house was taller than many of the other houses around us, we could potentially look into other people's homes and gardens. Now, this photo is just an illustration that we could potentially see into other people's spaces. But on the first night we moved in, Mr. Journalist spent a long time on the rooftop without our knowledge. And suddenly there was loud knocking and banging on our metal gates. I looked at the people, and a mob had gathered outside. I quickly told my Afghan housekeeper to open the door to find out what was wrong, and then he came back and said that they demand that our Caucasian friend come down from the roof. You know, he was invading their privacy. If he doesn't come down, they would shoot him. I quickly got my colleague down, and he said, Oh, come on. Don't, don't be too... Um, to bother, they're just exaggerating. I was just talking to our neighbor on our rooftop and he was so friendly. Did he do any harm? Maybe he did not mean harm, but his cultural insensitivity meant that he would be angering our neighbors and potentially putting himself or ourselves in danger. I mentioned three anecdotes. You know, one on children's rights, one on photography, and one on rooftop friendship. But these three fail to help us navigate some of the more ethical dilemmas on the ground. You know, on the surface, all three meant no harm, and potentially and possibly did no harm. In fact, the first ideally promoted human rights, and the second and third friendship across international borders is a good outcome, a good life. But in Applied Theatre, Helen, uh, Helen Nicholson's book, Applied Drama, uh, she reminds practitioners about the need for a praxis that promoted plurality of perspectives that did not discriminate ways of living. She said in the final line, 
what does it mean to act ethically in contexts where there are competing conceptions of the good life amongst participants in a flight drama? But still, how do we act ethically? Now, the question remains to be answered. Now, let me go into one of my case studies that was published in the Routledge Companion to Applied Performance. The date was 11 December 2014. And there was a performance titled Heartbeat, Silence After the Explosion at the Institute Francais Afghanistan Auditorium. Let's just watch a little bit of this. And I do need to warn you that viewers' discretion is advised because there is violence in this video clip. And as you can see, in this show, actors were accompanied by musicians from the Afghanistan National Institute of Music. It was an ensemble piece driven by improvisation and movement. And then around the 30th minute of the performance, an explosion went off at the back of the auditorium and confusion set in. You know, some audience members were amazed by the theatrical effects. But when darkness and smoke enveloped the theatre, followed by cries, it was then realised that it was not a fictional bombing. It did not help that the title of the show was Silence After the Explosion. So that double layer of making meaning confused a lot of people. Now apparently a suicide bomber had snuck in and killed himself. The Taliban claimed responsibility and a spokesperson condemned the show as desecrating Islamic values and that it was propaganda against jihad. They wrote in their statement, quote, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan takes this opportunity to warn certain immoral media and all organizations acting in the name of civil society, issuing publications, disseminating reports, attacking Islamic values, 
organizing meetings and demonstrations against the veil and in favor of music, prostitution and corruption and helping to manipulate society's young people. We inform them that from now on the Mujahideen will not remain indifferent in these activities and will destroy the very core of these corruptors." Unquote. You know, when I read this on the internet, I was back in the UK at the time. I was at a loss. I panicked. I tried to contact my friends, the actors whom I've gotten to know when I was in Kabul to see if they survived the bomb blast. And that day, I desperately wanted an answer to see why theatre desecrated Islamic values. I discovered that Malaysia had also banned several musicians before, such as Megadeth, Chicago, Battle of the Bands, and even Beyonce. But still, I couldn't understand why. I did not understand what was the reason. I did not want to universalize Muslim communities and arrive at a standard set of values. But then this was a case study I wanted to write about. And I couldn't. I felt disingenuous to write about it as an outsider, as if it was an event covered in the news. And if I were to take that distance relationship as a researcher, I would have been insincere in my approach. After all, these were friends I had shared rehearsal spaces with, and I couldn't write about them from that distance. I came to a crisis in representation. It was an ethical one. Because of my familiarity and connections with that space and with the actors, I, my writing style oscillated clumsily between objectivity, which is a third-person narrative, and subjectivity, the first-person narrative. Now, this clumsiness, I think, represents real gaps in meaning-making. And that in my academic writing and, anal and analysis, I should not seek for closure. These gaps, these absences are performance markers to show that ethics is not about doing no harm. But in my representation of the other, I questioned, where do I stand in my relationship with the other, with them, with my friends? Here I also draw on Emmanuel Levinas' concept of the face. In his book, totality and infinity, Levinas argues that human beings are defined not by their autonomy but by their responsibility to others. He contends that our relationship to the other person is the foundation of ethics and that a face-to-face -face encounter with the other person is the origin of ethical responsibility. There is an urgency of response, my response for example, to the suicide attack. Now here's my final case study to further problematize the ethical dilemmas while doing my research. In 2012, a group of Afghan actors came to London to perform at the Globe Theatre during the Cultural Olympiad. A BBC documentary was made with this theatre group and in that documentary, the foreign director who was directing Shakespeare's The Comedy of Errors said that she was not doing a humanitarian project, nor an aid project. She says, I'm doing culture, quote and unquote. The Comedy of Errors was a show with a lot of sexual innuendos through mistaken identities. And when questioned about the intimate sex scenes between the men and women in the latter part of the documentary, the director says, quote, I'm not a feminist in that sense. And I'm not doing it for the purpose of, oh, I'm going to make them, these women more free. It is more to do with, I'm an artist, and I'm putting on a play with them and telling a story. And in order to do that, this is what we need to do. Unquote. I was there at the Globe Theatre in London. And after the performance, everyone stood up and gave the ensemble a standing ovation for 15 minutes. I think it would have gone on for a longer time if the ushers had not chased everyone out. And during the post-show reception, I interviewed a few of them. One of the older actresses started crying and said that it was a very uncomfortable show 
to do because of the physical intimacy. I asked her why she didn't inform the organizers and the producers, and her reply was, I told them. They said you've taken the money, so you have to complete the project. She later added that if she were to return to Afghanistan, she could be killed, as she had already been threatened before. In contrast, the younger actress said, well, even if I became a victim, it would have been worth it. If we don't do this, i.e. act, then who would? Now, these polarizing views troubled me a lot as a researcher. It was not my ethical problem, but I was faced with an ethical dilemma. And the encountering of their faces meant I needed to respond, at least in my writing. I then referred to performance theorist Bas Kershaw's article. He wrote, The louder and longer we applaud, the more we participate in the making of masterpieces. Standing ovation becomes an orgasm of self-congratulation for money so brilliantly spent. The applause is the moment in which the collective aims to assert itself over the individual in which an imagined community is forged. Now, it did not help that during these performances, the articles online, the media, all presented the Afghans as being heroes of their journey, defying all odds to come to London to perform. And then this made me think, did the younger actress think that because we applauded their performance, that made her think that the performance was therefore very good? And so if she suffered later, it would have been worth it. Did we as audience members continue to forge a victimhood narrative over the Afghans? And worse, because of my participation in the standing ovation, had I also become complicit in the production of violence? I started today's presentation first with anecdotes, which did not obviously go into my PhD thesis, to demonstrate that do no harm is perhaps too elementary a perspective to take when operating in a conflict zone. Then I went on to discuss two case studies to further problematize the politics and ethics in representation by referring to Levinician philosophy to help me navigate a response. And by the time I ended the last case study, it almost feels like an ethical failure when I see myself as complicit in the production of violence. I don't think there is an easy answer, but through this presentation and through these research exercises, more complex questions emerge for us to think about. Thank you.